update. We're going to have to move that just a little bit. We're going to have to shift it to the right by about 30 minutes. And so we will be doing that one at 3.30 p.m. today. I'll give you a little more time between this one. Um, today we have with us again uh, General Carl Strzok, uh, somebody that doesn't need any introduction to you. He's been kind enough to come here on a periodic occasion and give you an update on what the Corps of Engineers has been doing down in uh, Louisiana. And uh, without any further, I think I'll just turn it over to him. And uh, he's got some things that he wants to open with, and then we'll get into some questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I really do appreciate this opportunity to spend a little time with you all. And what I'd like to do is, is uh, just remind you of, of some of the elements of the Corps of Engineers' role in uh, response and recovery to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and then answer any questions you might have of, of us. Uh, before I start, I'd, I'd like to clarify one thing that's a bit confusing to some folks. When you see me up here in uniform and I talk about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, there are really two Corps of Engineers. One is the branch of the Army. And that branch has about 80,000 80, soldiers, which are active guard and reserve. And then you have a major command of the Army called the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is what I command. And that is comprised of 34,000 people. All but about 500 are civilians, career civilians in all uh, fields of endeavor. So when we talk about the Corps of Engineers' response here, it's mainly those people that I'm talking about. So in the past, you, you've seen me as a military officer, and I refer to, well, that's what the military is doing. That was some of the confusion in, in previous uh, occasions when I've spoken with you. So that's who I am and, and what we do. Um, we have standing missions in civil works. We're responsible principally for the nation's water resources. We do inland and deep draft navigation. We do flood control, hydroelectric generation, a lot of recreation, and a lot of things in the civil community. And those skills then come to, uh, to bear when we respond to disaster. We also have a large military construction mission, which is worldwide, where we support military forces uh, and provide the facilities they need for training and readiness. In terms of our response to uh, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, again, we're doing it in three ways. Uh, direct support to FEMA. We're in support of the Department of Defense response, which is also in support of FEMA. And we're doing our inherent mission responsibilities mainly related to flood control and navigation. Where, where FEMA is, res, uh, is concerned, uh, we are <clears throat> responding as part of the National Response Plan, which is uh, based on the old federal response plan, which used to be just directed at response to natural disaster. With the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and putting FEMA under the department, they've broadened the, the response plan to include response to terrorist attacks with the idea that the cause of the catastrophe, uh, while important, is not really relevant in terms of our response because what you have is the same results. You have displaced people in need of food and water and shelter and medical attention and all those things. And so FEMA now uh, responds to, regardless of the, of the nature of the uh, uh, incident, uh, responds in pretty much the same way, and that's the, that's the theory behind the National Response Plan. We are responsible for what is called Emergency Support Function 3, which is ESF 3. That's public works. There are 15 of these ESFs uh, and for which different branches or different uh, departments have responsibility. Uh, under that, we have missions to provide <clears throat> the bulk ice and water. We provide temporary power, temporary roofing, debris removal, which is our biggest mission in this one. Um, we're doing technical assistance, and we're responsible for interagency <coughs> coordination of infrastructure requirements in the response and recovery. We also do special missions like the unwatering of New Orleans that I'm sure you're very familiar with. In terms of support to the Department of Defense, uh, it's mainly through staff or, uh, augmentation. Both the Joint Task Force that stood up in response to Hurricane Katrina under General Honore and the similar one that stood up under General Clark from Fifth Army uh, to respond to Rita. Uh, both of those had uh, personnel from the Corps of Engineers, general officers who are in command of our divisions that went forward to become the engineer and took with them military and civilian staff members to help coordinate the activities of military forces, federal military forces that were responding. Air Force, Navy, Marines, and, sea, uh, and uh, Army engineers uh, were out there responding to the disaster. Um, <clears throat> In terms of our own inherent missions, there's a public law called 8499, which gives us authorities uh, to do flood fighting without 
doing it uh, under FEMA control without being directed to do so because we have a responsibility in those, in those instances. So we are now using those authorities to respond to this, and that mainly takes the form of uh, doing the actual flood fights during the emergency and then repairing the systems back to the original configuration following the emergency. We use these, these funds to do that. The other big mission is restoration of navigation, and we've now had two uh, very successful occasions to, to get involved in that, first under Katrina and then under Rita. And in both cases, we work very closely with the National Oce Oceanographic and the Atmosphere Administration to do surveys uh, of the uh, ports and channels and with the Coast Guard to restore navigation aids and then where necessary to remove obstructions or shoaling, the Corps of Engineers goes in and, and takes care of that mission. So we've done that in both cases. <clears throat> um, just a quick update. Uh, uh, as you know, Rita did not have the catastrophic uh, impacts that we thought, but uh, like Katrina, we were prepositioned. Uh, uh, we had uh, response teams uh, ready to go and then move into the disaster area once the weather cleared in all the areas that I talked about. One of the more challenging aspects of RETA for us has been the response to uh, the, the need to respond to power requirements. Uh, there was some significant damage to the uh, fixed power uh, production in Texas, and so there's been a very heavy reliance on temporary generation. And we're talking fairly significant generators here. We're not talking little Honda things. We're talking generators that can power up old hospitals or, or uh, administrative facilities. So generation has been a, a big role here. Uh, we also had a significant roofing mission in, um, in Katrina, I mean in Rita, much like uh, in Katrina. Uh, right now we're looking at, um, <clears throat> we estimate about uh, 70,000 roofs in Louisiana and about 35,000 in Mississippi and about 5,000 in Texas. So a big mission to go in and allow people to reoccupy their homes until they can put permanent repairs in place. This is critical to solving some of the housing shortages we see. It's put people back where they live. Um, the debris mission is also uh, uh, one of the most significant ones for us right now. We estimate that we have somewhere between 40 and 70 million cubic yards of debris to move. And again, to put that in perspective, if you can all remember Hurricane Andrew, about 18 million yards of debris then, and it took about nine months to clean up. So this is a huge effort on this. The range there has to do with whether or not we do removal of private debris. Typically, we just remove debris from public rights of way, and we will take private citizens' debris when they bring it to those rights of way. That's about 40,000 cubic yards of debris. If we get involved in demolition and removal of, of residential and structural debris, then it could go up to 70 million cubic yards. We have been very successful so far. We've moved about 8 million cubic yards in the last 30 days. Again, think back to Andrew, 18 million, nine months, we've moved 8 million in 30 days here. And the reason we're able to do that is we've put very large contracts in place and we've surged on this mission because it really is the way that we set the conditions for recovery by getting people access back into their uh, uh, homes and towns and allowing the recovery to begin to take place. So debris has been a, a, a big part of this, this mission. Um, associated with that, uh, well, let me, let me before, I, before I get into that piece, the other things we're doing right now that are related to our inherent responsibilities are conducting uh, project condition surveys, and we do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, we need to put the projects back in their condition uh, that they were pre-landfall. And so we got to go out and figure out what needs to be done there and then make those needs known to Congress and the administration for uh, resourcing. But the second is we also need to make sure that decision makers are aware of the level of risk associated with the condition of the projects, especially our flood and hurricane protection projects. And as you know, Mayor Nagin, uh, in his um, decisions on when and how to reoccupy the city of New Orleans, has to understand those risks. And we characterize the risk to the citizens of New Orleans in two ways. First of all, uh, risk to normal rain events because the city's pumps, which normally pump down the rainwater, are uh, uh, at significant reduced capacity. So, for example, in central New Orleans, uh, the pumps are only operating about 40 percent capacity. So it's conceivable if you get a, a prolonged rain event, you could get another six feet of water back in there that the pumps simply can't tend with, contend with. Uh, the other risk has to do with the integrity of the levee systems around New Orleans. We saw that in, ta in uh, uh, Hurricane Rita, 
uh, we had some overtopping of the repairs that we made following Katrina. We anticipated a storm surge of anywhere to th three to six feet uh, in Lake Pontchartrain, and in the Inner Harbor part of the city, we got about eight feet of storm surge, so we were not prepared for that, so we, we saw elements of St. Bernard's Parish, specifically the Ninth Ward, got reflooded during Rita. And just to give you an idea of the kind of forces we're dealing with here, Rita was over 200 miles away, but it caused a surge of that magnitude in the inner, inner harbor of, of New Orleans, eight feet of additional water from a system that passed that far away. So these are, these are tremendously powerful events we're dealing with here. Um, the other thing, that, of course, we're doing is assessing the performance of the system uh, because we want to put it back in shape as quickly as possible. It is our goal that by the beginning of next hurricane season, which is around the 1st of June of next year, we will have the Category 3 protection that existed prior to Cortina back in place. And that's an ambitious goal, but we think we can make it. One of the critical things there is if there's some problem with the design we had there, if there was some reason why we had breaches in the, in the uh, 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 flood walls in the inner part of the city that had to do with a design error or anything like that, we want to find that out so as we rebuild the system, we can incorporate those fixes into it. So there's this real sense of urgency and understanding exactly what happened out there is a big part of our effort right now. Let me close by just uh, talking a little bit about contracting because I know there's a lot of interest about that. Uh, we, have, um, we have used in some cases sole source contracts, but I would say that uh, that is that only as a last resort and only with full justification uh, do, do we do that. Uh, the federal acquisition regulations allow you to use sole sourcing in emergency situations. We certainly faced that in the early days, and we did a number of both small business and large business uh, sole source contracts to get things going. Uh, since that time, though, uh, all of our contracts have been competitive, and um, we are trying very hard to create opportunities for small and local business so that we can stimulate the economy in the impacted areas. One of the most notable areas I mentioned earlier was the debris, uh, about a $2 billion mission assignment from FEMA to do that. Uh, we have given all of our debris contracts so far to large businesses because we face that tension of a rapid response and getting things going quickly, uh, which you can do with large firms that can mobilize and bring resources to bear very quickly, versus the need to, to stimulate the economy through use of small and local businesses. A small and local would have required a more dispersed effort on our part and would have been much more difficult to get the kind of traction we've gotten on the debris effort. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we have given out um, uh, two million dollars of capacity in the, or two billion dollars worth of capacity in the debris contracts. I want to underscore the word capacity. What we do is, is we, we um, advertise these. We had 22 contractors that uh, bid on these. We found 17 to be acceptable and we awarded to four. We awarded four or five hundred million dollar capacity contracts and we will start then issuing task orders against those. Uh, at the same time, though, we'll be looking for opportunities now that the, that the crisis is largely passed to create opportunities in debris and roofing and other areas for small and local business to get, to get involved. So in summary, um, we, we feel like we are uh, at the early stages of setting the conditions for recovery. Um, we think we have a good plan and a way ahead. Uh, we feel like we're certainly adequately resourced through FEMA to carry out what, uh, what we need to do to, to do our ESF3 uh, uh, responsibilities. And um, we're also now standing up and reconstituting our capability to respond to any other natural or terrorist attack, natural disaster or terrorist attack that might be looming on the horizon. Well, thank you very much for your patience, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the levees, could you walk back back through that in a little more detail for sure. a second? Um, you're rebuilding to Category 3, yes. which is what you had. Why not, just for <coughs> us laymen, mm. why not go ahead and, number one, rebuild to 4? Mm. Is it a question of finances or risk-benefit? And what's your feeling about this possibility of a design error? Do you think there is one? What's, what's your initial analysis? Uh, if I could have the slide that shows the levee system, can you pop that up here for me? Um, first of all, the, why not go to Cat 5? Um, the principal thing is authorities. We, we must have authority to do that. We must be directed uh, through legislation to, to put that level of protection in. So that's the first thing that's necessary. 
We have um, been studying the feasibility of a Category 5 protection for a number of years. In 1999, we were directed to begin that study. We do a thing called a reconnaissance study, and, and essentially that's a study to look at whether or not it would be feasible to provide Level 5 protection to the city. And a very important aspect of that is whether there's a federal interest in doing so, because the federal government does not get involved unless there's a federal interest. And all of these projects are done with a local sponsor who provides a cost share. The levy system we're talking about here, and it's mainly, while well, there are a number of projects here, most of the levies you see depicted here are part of the Lake Pontchartrain Hurricane Protection System, funded 70 percent federal, 30 percent local. And once we build the thing, we turn it over to the locals for ownership, operation, and maintenance. So part of it is the authority to go to Category 5. That reconnaissance study indicated it was feasible and there is a federal interest. The next step is to go to a feasibility study where you begin to get into detailed planning. This again is cost shared. The reconnaissance is all federal. Feasibility is 50-50 cost share. And the cost of that study is probably about $12, billion, $12 million to, to get that study complete. Uh, so that's the next step would be to move into that phase with the local sponsor. And I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of interest in moving that ahead as quickly as we can. The design error. By the uh, way, do you need that also to go just to four or only to go to five? Four or five. Right now our authorization is to category three. And what's your instinct on the question of a design error? Is it a design error or maybe the storm was stronger well, than anybody thought? That's, that's what we have to find out, ma'am. What I, I've been very careful to describe these as breaches and overtopping where we know overtopping occurred. But in the canal sections uh, where we had flood walls uh, that were breached, I'm not calling those failures yet because a failure is when something doesn't operate as designed. And what we have to go down and look at uh, what forces were put against these structures. We know that the hurricane was a Category 4 when it made landfall uh, in, in Louisiana, which was away from New Orleans. Uh, and then we know that it was a Category 3 when it made landfall in Mississippi. Uh, these storms are characterized by wind speeds by storm surges and by the barometric pressures associated with them. All of them have a, an influence in the pressures and stresses put on our structures. So we're going to go through a very detailed engineering analysis to find out uh, what stresses those projects were subjected to, whether it was a question of overtopping, erosion, just why it is that those flood walls breached. Uh, I really don't have any intuitive um, response to that except to, to say that uh, we, we know that down in here, and this is St. Bernard's Parish here, that the levees back here were clearly overtopped, overtopped by a storm surge coming out of Lake Bourne. We saw the same thing further to the south in Plaquemines Parish. Breton Sound, we think the storm surge coming out of there caused the overtopping of those levees. Up here in Lake Pontchartrain, uh, we're not sure whether it was overtopping or whether it was simply the hydraulic impacts there. And, and the, the thing that we're really looking at here of interest is that uh, you have flood walls all along the lake, lake front here. The flood walls of breeze were in these canals in narrow areas. So perhaps there's something associated with the hydraulic uh, activity inside those narrow canals. And that's what we're really focusing our efforts on here at uh, 17th, here in the London Avenue, and also in the inner harbor of New Orleans. And here we have the Missouri River and Gulf Outlet, which, which could have forced waters into here. We have a uh, Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. And then we have a navigation channel coming out of the lake here. So we're going to look at, the, at, at how that water moved in there and what impact that might have had on the structures. I'm so sorry. Just very quickly, when you say hydraulic, do you mean mechanical issues in terms uh, of the... hydraulic in terms of moving water. Oh, but not mechanically involved, just how the water no, itself moved through no, the system. No, it's just, just the, the moving right. water. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry for that lengthy. It's, it's so a no, very, very complex uh, uh, task to take on here. Yes, ma'am. Can you be um, a little... Can you give us a little bit more detail on the contracts that have been issued to date? Can you just say about how many total there have been issued for what generally total amount of, of money, and then of that, how much were sole source contracts? Yes. Um, That's a constantly moving thing, and there's all kinds of ways to look at how much, how many task orders have actually been delivered versus a contract in place. Debris, for example, we have 200 or $2 billion of capacity, but we haven't issued a lot of task orders against that. I mean, not, not in a relative sense. Uh, just some figures I have, the, the latest I have right now is we have awarded through competitive, uh, th through uh, contracting, about $500 million of contracting. Uh, about, and this is not, this does not include those debris contracts aside from those, $500 million. 
about uh, half of that has gone to small business. And of those, uh, the 18 contracts to small business, eight of those were awarded sole source, and it's a relatively small part of that. On the large business side, 28 contracts to large business, uh, so that's a total of 46 contracts. 28 of those have gone to large business for about $240 million, and of those, five were sole source based on emergency situations. We also have a lot of simplified acquisitions, and there was some discussion about the, the level of authority for a simplified acquisition. And these are where we can simply issue letter orders to, for, for products and services. We've done uh, about $28 million worth of, uh, of s simplified acquisitions. A total of about 100, and 60 percent of those have gone to small business. And about, about 40 percent of that 100 have been sole source without a competitive simplified acquisition process. So we have. For, they're not the well, they're for services um, uh, like um, data gathering, uh, dump trucks, uh, things that we can that that, uh, that can be provided that are not uh, not more complex, not not more complicated uh, projects. There are also it, there's a dollar threshold associated with this, and I can't recall what it is. I think it's about two hundred fifty thousand was it was raised to that for this particular event. And can you project out how much you think this will cost? Uh, the overall response? Um, well, we have over $3 billion worth of mission assignments from FEMA, which includes the debris, the ice, the water, the power, and the roofing. So uh, that part, about $3 billion. Um, we, we think that the restoration of the levee system uh, in Plaquemines Parish and in the parishes around New Orleans is probably going to cost about a, an additional $1.6 billion. And we have already received around $450 uh, million in funding to carry out our work on navigation and flood control. So it's, you're talking about a $2 billion there probably associated with the, re with the repair and restoration of the levees and navigation system. So altogether, the Corps of Engineers probably about $5 billion in this effort. Yes, sir. General, you mentioned last time that, that there was a study that showed, as you remembered it, about it would cost about two and a half billion, a, right. a minimum of two and a half billion to yes, bring sir. these levees up to four or five. Um, uh, have there been any concrete steps taken toward that? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned earlier that that you all would need authorization to do that. Mm. Have there been any concrete steps? No, not not to, not to move ahead to the Category Five uh, protection. No, sir. That that still remains an initial estimate, and it's somewhere between two and a half and three and a half billion dollars, depending on what you decide to do. And also has to use that terrible Pentagon word, has the, has the city been unwatered? <laughs> How close yeah. is it to uh, being unwatered? Today, it, was, it, it should be unwatered today, and I believe it is. I think we're pretty well down. There may be some small pockets here and there, but uh, the city is essentially dry now. And we have restored, I mentioned earlier prior to Rita, we had a seven-foot level of protection. That's seven feet above the normal level of Lake Pontchartrain. That's now at 10 feet at all the breach sites in, in and around the city. So we have gotten that level of protection restored. We use the unwatering term because once water gets into a structure, you have to unwater it. Dewatering is keeping water out of a structure or, or a construction site. So sorry for that little and twist of words if there. I'm wrong. You say you're, <clears throat> you're going to 10 feet now. You yes, know, sir. The process is going to 10 feet. And you hope to go to 14 feet by, by 14 feet, I think, was the There, there are various level. levels depending on where you are in the system. Some of these uh, flood walls are as high as 17 and a half feet. The, the initial, the system is designed to handle a, a surge in Lake Pontchartrain up to 11 and a half feet, and then we build above that for wave action and a factor of safety. But that would all come prior to next hurricane season. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, you mentioned <clears throat> you needed legislation to uh, move to Category 4 or 5. Is that congressional or is that at the state level? It would require congressional legislation. I mean, the state could do it on their own, but, uh, but obviously they'd, they'd like some federal assistance here. But uh, it, that would be uh, congressional legislation. And walk me through the process. The next step would be a feasibility study, and then yes. how long does that take and what happens after that? Well, in, in normal times, a feasibility study of this complexity and magnitude would probably take us 24 to 30 months just to complete and get to what is called a chief's report. And the chief's report says, is it technically feasible, is it economically justified, and is it environmentally acceptable? We clearly, if, if directed to continue with this category 5 study, we need to compress that timeline. 
one of the uh, challenges we have, there are certain uh, blocks of time which you must put into a schedule. These tip are typically associated with the um, uh, National e Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA processes of public notification and comment, which require you to have a period of time that, that can be, that can, things can be scrutinized by the public and interested parties. Are, are local governments going to have to hold hearings on if the Congress says, yes, you can uh, upgrade to four and five, are there going to have to be public hearings at the local government level from people who live nearby where they can object if they feel that they live near it but they don't want it to go up to four or five? Yes, and that's the NEPA process that allows people to have their say. It allows people to look at it from all aspects of environmental, social, economic, and uh, it allows them to have their say, which we consider in making our recommendation. Do you know how long that process takes? Well, that's, that's why I say a feasibility study to get to Chief's report and get through all those, uh, all those processes is 24 to 30 months normally. Again, we'll try to compress that. And then the actual construction is the other limiting factor, the physical business of constructing the project. Depending on what we decide to do, it could be years before we get it. Again, if, if we are given the go-ahead to, uh, to implement, then we will look for ways to fast-track that construction and get it in place as quickly as possible. Yes, ma'am. You were talking about the problem with the pumps, the fact that a certain large mm -hmm. number of them are incapacitated. Mm -hmm. Are they are they broken or are they you can't get to them because of, of debris? What is the problem and how long do you think it'll take to fix it? And is, is that your mission? The, the main problem is is uh, is damage during flooding. If, uh, if you could go back to this one, yeah, I'll, I'll show you this one, and then maybe the cross section in a minute here. Uh, what you see, and I know you can't see it very well here, but these dots down here are pumping stations. Uh, the newer ones are up, up along the levees here. Some of the older ones, and some of these have been in place for a hundred years or more. These are some of these are old, old systems. Um, <coughs> these these pumps are part of a thing called the South Southeast Louisiana uh, project, and they are all about dewatering the city, keeping rain, getting rainwater out of the city. These are not meant to fight floods. Uh, so this is just about uh, interior drainage. And so there's a certain limit to their capacity. And the way they're positioned in the city, if the city is flooded, when the city was flooded, the pumps and their electrical infrastructure went underwater because they're not designed to operate during floods. So our challenge now is, is getting the water out of <clears throat> the city, uh, bringing the pumps out of the water, and then getting them rehabbed and back in shape. It requires us to drain the fluids out of the pumps and replace those. It requires us to uh, rehab generation and get power back in and so on. So that's, that's the challenge right now with, with the pumps in the, in the city. How long do you think it will take? Well, I, I, I can't give you a good answer on that. Um, we went from zero to about 40 percent here in, uh, in the central part of the city in about three weeks. Some of these are long term. As I mentioned, some of these are very old pumps. And in fact, the only place you can get parts for these pumps is a manufacturing site down in this area of New Orleans where they actually build parts for some of these pumping systems. So I, I can't get, give you a good answer on how long that might take. But if next week, say, there were <coughs> sustained heavy rains, you could end up with another six feet of water? Yeah, at the outside. We, we have, uh, we've got our, our hydrographic models that, that show us for various levels of rainfall in the city how much ponding we could expect based on the condition of the pumps. And if you look uh, up in this, this area of the city here, this is the lowest part of the city. This is where you might get as much as six feet if, if, if that should occur. And then as you move toward the Mississippi River, the flooding is less and less. Could I have that cross-section, Mark, if that's available real quickly? <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is what we face here. If, if you look at distance from the sea, this is the Mississippi River over here, and this is the, the side of the city the French Quarter is on. In fact, this French Quarter is right there. This is cut through the city from the French Quarter to the University of New Orleans. Uh, this point right here is 116 miles from the ocean by river. This point here is essentially at sea level. Typically, Lake Pontchartrain is about one foot above sea level. And this is, the, this is the real challenge of New Orleans here. The ground was built up by the, by the, by the Mississippi River. Uh, and so you have the, the higher portions of the city here, which are not as prone to flooding, and the lower portions over here. And you have a series of, of bowls within the city that will fill up with water. And this is where those pumps are supposed to move that water out of here. And that's the challenge we face in New Orleans for rainwater. Did I get it, all your questions? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. General, would that, the time frames that you mentioned for studying <coughs> and constructing, would that be further compressed if you went to a different system? You mentioned last time you were here about some seawalls that, mm -hmm. that were rejected last time. Would, would mm -hmm. that be a, a quicker 
possibly quicker way to do this? Potentially, yeah. If, if I could have the navigation chart here, I'll show you what we're talking about there. This was a, and there's a lot of controversy associated with this. Uh, one more. There we go. Um, the original 1965 proposal by the Corps of Engineers was to build barriers down here. This is Lake Pontchartrain. And you have narrow inlets down here. And the idea was to build barriers there which could be closed uh, in, in, in times like this to prevent a storm surge getting up into the lake. If you built those barriers and took off the good part of that storm surge, you could, you could protect New Orleans with lower levees. At that time, the levees, we, we thought 10 to 14 foot levees would protect New Orleans if we'd installed those barriers. We now have levees on the magnitude of 16 to 17 feet around New Orleans. So lower levees because you had a barrier to take off the storm surge. Uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, we, uh, we abandoned that plan and went to what we call the high level plan of protection, which is what we currently have. So that would certainly be something we would consider uh, as we look about Category 5 protection. Theoretically, and I'm just, this is purely uh, theoretical, if those barriers were put in and could take off some of the storm surge, you might not need to raise the, the level of these levees now to get to Category 5 because Category 3 required lower levees than what we have now. So it might be possible to, by just installing barriers and reinforcing some of the levees to, to get to Category 5. The challenge would be, though, uh, in, in St. Bernard's Parish, this is Lake Bourne right here, uh, there would be no barrier there, and we still have that, sword, that storm surge to contend with on those levees. And then down here in Plaquemines Parish, uh, we've got this, the storm surge out of uh, Breton Sound here, which really overtopped the levees down in Plaquemines. What are the so. objections to the barrier? Uh, well, you know, it, it's, it's a real complex and long story. Uh, recall that in 1965, this was our proposal. In 1969, the NEPA Act was passed, and that required environmental impact statements and studies. Uh, the original project was challenged on the adequacy of the environmental impact statement and concerns over restricted water flows into Lake Pontchartrain and the effect on that ecosystem. And then there was a significant amount of litigation that lasted about 12 years when we finally said we will not do the barrier plan, we will go to the high level plan. And there were a lot of steps in between that, some of which uh, drove the costs in a different way. The barrier plan in 1965 was felt to be the most economic plan, but by the time we got into the 70s, the, the high level plan actually became uh, more cost effective than the barrier plan. So depending on where, where you want to take a snapshot in time on this project, you could make a case for, for, for either, either approach. The barriers are an effective uh, mechanism. The, the uh, City of London in England is, is protected from storm surge by a, by a moving uh, uh, surge barrier. Uh, Holland has a, a series of extensive barriers that, that are put in place when the North Sea swells occur. So it, it's proven technology and it's something we would consider as a solution to Cat 5 protection. General, on, on, on the feasibility study on the levees, is this a given, or do you have to have, all, do you need authorization for that? Well, we have, we, we have authorization, sir, now. To, uh, there's an authorized study, and that, that study has gone on. What would require is funding to move to the feasibility stage. Uh, in this year's uh, water resources bill, there is funding in there, not enough, about 250000 from the Senate to, to begin the study. So there's an opportunity as they conference that bill between the House and the Senate to put the adequate resources to accomplish this study. We think if we, uh, if we cost share, it would take about $4 million to, to, to take care of next year's study. Uh, if, if, if we do not get a local share, then about $8 million is what it would take to, to do the study. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much. Yeah. I have one more announcement to make, and it has to do with the first announcement that I made, and that is the briefing that I said was at 3 and moving to 3.30 is now moved back to 3. So disregard the earlier announcement and you'll be fine. <laughs>